Going beyond the box score today, everybody, talking about the Chargers and the Dolphins. What did we see from Tua Tonga Vailoa? What didn't we see from Tua and from Jalen Waddell in particular? Can you trust Nick Chubb and Travis Etienne in your playoffs? Can you trust Jerry Judy in your fantasy playoffs? So if you're asking Jacob Gibbs, I know the answer is going to be yes. <laughs> uh, we will ask Jacob Gibbs. This is beyond the box score, advanced stats from simple people, and we've got four big topics today. And those topics are struggling running backs like Etienne and Chubb, uh, Jerry Judy, as I mentioned, the Saints with their great schedule and the Jacksonville Jaguars and the distribution from Trevor Lawrence, who's getting the targets. Did you know that Trevor Lawrence, guys, has thrown the most passes into the end zone this season? Most end zone passes. (laughs) How about that? (laughs) I did not know that. Yeah. Uh, Like Christian Kirk and Zay Jones, I think both have 10 end zone targets this year. That's a that's a lot. Not surprise me at all. Unfortunately, he's 21st in completion rate on the end zone targets, so not turning a ton of them into touchdowns. But all right, guys, uh, how was Friendsgiving, Dan? It was great. We had a good time. My guacamole was a hit. That's I don't make too many things, Adam, but there are a few things that I make, and I really do a great job on them from feedback. It's not just my own personal opinion from the feedback I get. Uh, And so it was so good that when you take, usually when you take a dish to a Friendsgiving or something of that nature, when you're done with it, if it hasn't all been eaten, the host will like give it back to you and offer to give it back. And and the host did offer to, but I said, if I leave it here, will you eat it? And she said, oh, hell yeah, we'll be eating oh, this. Good. So that was all uh-huh. I needed to hear, left it with the host. And that's a great feeling because normally I want to get all the food out of the house. It's not mm-hmm. that good. It's cupcakes and things of that nature. No, no, no. A nice guac with a few added touches. One of my key touches is jalapenos, which a lot of people don't use. Yeah, that would be me. Um, you don't use I think it. the bigger question is why wasn't it all finished during Friendsgivings? But that's that's OK. <laughs> I mean, that's OK. There were a uh, lot of other things. J- Jacob, how is uh, what one food item if you were going to make would be what? Whew, that's tough. I really don't make much food. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't strike me as a cook. No, you put me on the spot here and I was not ready. <laughs> I'm looking up Trevor Lawrence off target rates, man. That's all right. All right well, why don't we get the football then? Chargers 23, Dolphins 17. The Chargers had the ball for almost 40 minutes. They ran 78 plays. Miami ran 49 plays. And I think you could really see at the end, the Dolphins were just out of breath. Uh, could not get off the field on defense. Uh, all right, so who wants the Dolphins? Raise your hand if you'd like to talk about the Dolphins. Dolphins okay. are fun. All right, Dan, you can take the Dolphins. We'll give uh, the Chargers over to Jacob. What's your takeaways here? This is three straight games with fewer than 18 points for Tua. One of them was the blowout where he left in the third quarter against the Texans, but it's two stinkers in a row against the Niners and the Chargers. What, what do you think about this, this offense in general? It's just Tyree Kill right now getting it done. Yeah, I think what we saw last night was really interesting from a schematic standpoint. The Chargers basically only ran a combination of three coverages: cover t- uh, cover two, cover six, and two, or cover three, co- or no, cover two, cover six, and two man, which is just basically man coverage underneath with two safeties over the top. And every single time I watched the film on it, every single time when the ball was snapped, those linebackers, those second level defenders, would drop to incredible depth to get in the middle of those passing lanes. So what I think the Dolphins need to do is find a way, and this shouldn't be too hard because you have Mike McDaniel, he comes from the Shanahan system, find a way to get back to a little bit of that running game, find a way to work that running game back in, find a way to get the defenses so they have to respect the running game to some degree right now, whether that be with Wilson who got hurt or Mostert, whatever it may be, because right now, Teams are going to look at that blueprint the Chargers put out there, and they're going to do the same thing. They're going to drop those linebackers to depth. They're going to play with two men over the top. They're going to play a lot of cover six. They're going to do different things to get different second and third level defenders in those passing lanes. And right now, it's not like what you're seeing is not working for the Dolphins. They need to figure out something different. And I think a big part of that would be kind of, I know people hate to hear it, but establishing the run a little bit more. I completely agree. I thought they were very stubborn last night. It just clearly wasn't working. And you say the blueprint that the Chargers established, but I I think you can even go back a week earlier. Uh, This is just, I'm going to read this directly from the Miami Herald. While the 49ers used their rangy linebackers to minimize passing windows into zone coverage, it's basically exactly what Dan was talking about, Chargers coach Brandon Staley said Los Angeles called on its cornerbacks to press Miami's wide receivers and disrupt timing. And then Mike McDaniel said it was more about their plan was better than ours, and they outplayed us in that phase. So, yeah, I mean, you're facing the worst run defense in football. Run the ball a little bit more. Try some right. shorter passes. Do something a little bit different. Um, I'm hopeful that they can. But in their last two games, the Dolphins have had the ball for about 20 minutes in each game. They've just gotten their butts kicked. Uh, do we have confidence that they bounce back against the Buffalo Bills this week? 
No. Is there, is there another start? Is there anyone you're starting against the Bills other than Tyreek? Tyreek? No. I will be benching every other Dolphin but Tyreek. I mean, look, I, I, I shouldn't say that. If I have, uh, I'm not going to start like Darius Slayton over Jalen Waddle or something like that. Like Jalen right. Waddle, you probably have to get in your lineup just based on attrition and how your fantasy lineups look. But I'm not going to be excited about starting anyone but Tyreek. How about you, Jacob? Yeah, I think it's if depending on what happens with Jeff Wilson, we could, you could start most there. Like we've seen pretty good usage for him the last couple of weeks. The result hasn't been there, but yeah, I don't feel good about the offense as a whole. So it's entirely likely that that usage will just turn into nothing again. Uh, so probably just Tyreek. All right. I, I'm hoping they can be a little bit better. They did have Toronto Armstead last night. Uh, and I like the pressure was so overwhelming. Jay just, just didn't play with, with that well. All right, let's go over to the Chargers now. And Justin Herbert only scored 21 and a half fantasy points. But I thought it really played a terrific game. Uh, Jacob, what are your takeaways from the Chargers? Yeah, they were pretty conservative as well, which is a little bit frustrating given the matchup against um, an aggressive, man-heavy Miami coverage scheme. Um, the average depth of target for the Chargers was just 5.1 yards. And yeah, I don't know. Anytime you ask me to talk about the Chargers, I'm just going to complain about Lombardi because I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't understand it. Like they don't. I will they, say, that, yeah, go ahead. I want you to finish it. I will make my point because I have a little bit of a counter to that. Well, they don't have great field stretchers, which is not something we've talked about. But at the same time, like average depth of target for Keenan Allen is 3.8 yards. He had 14 targets, and his average depth of target was still that low. Same thing with Gerald Everett, who was second on the team in targets. Then Austin Eckler is also second on the team in targets. They each had eight. Everett's average depth of target was 3.8. Like the offense is just flowing through these short yardage options. And it's just, I don't know, like Mike Williams played a full role and caught every single target for 116 yards and a touchdown is one of the best wide receivers against man coverage over the past three years. Like throw him the ball. It seems like he that might really work. Play. He was a little limited though. I think his, his snaps were down a bit. He, I mean, he ran 41 routes. Like he was just behind Josh Palmer for second on the team. 45. Yeah. They really, I mean, how many routes did they run though? Like 60, 56 dropbacks. Keenan Allen led the team with 51. So like he was a little bit limited, but down. yeah, slightly. All right. What were you going to say, Dan? So my one counter to that, I've seen this play out so many times over the last decade with the New York Giants. When you have an offensive line that is that injured and that banged up and you have the guys in that they have and they cannot produce, you kind of sometimes see, and you can, some people use it as an excuse, others don't. I might be. You can see offensive coordinators really alter what they want to do. When I watch the Chargers, Jacob, what do I see? I see a lot of play action, move the pocket, right? When you're moving the pocket and you're getting the running back, I'm sorry, the quarterback outside of the pocket on bootlegs and design rollouts, it's really hard to stretch the field. It's really hard to have a high A dot. The whole point of those plays is to fake the run and then kind of hit the tight end leaking or hit the receiver kind of coming over the middle on mesh or on like a slide route. So I've seen this play out. They don't really trust the offensive line to run a drop back pass game. And like you said, not having field stretchers plays a role as well. So I do think he's somewhat limited Lombardi. It is frustrating as hell, though, because this is not Daniel Jones. It's Justin Herbert. He has the arm talent to stretch the field if it was like if they believed in their offensive line, if they believed in the receivers. I just think last year we saw with Lombardi, there weren't this many like complaints about his play calling. I remember the A dot wasn't insanely low. There was bombs. They were stretching the field because they trusted their offensive line. They had like the best rookie left tackle in the last decade in Rashawn Slater playing for them. And now they don't have that. So I don't know. I just feel a lot of this is just offensive line based. I think a lot of their struggles are red zone based. They have the, I think the fifth yep. lowest red zone conversion rate in the NFL. Um, they stink there and they were three of six last night in the red zone. That's really bad. They turned the ball over on downs at the two yard line on their opening trip. The good news is they've gotten to the red zone more than any team other than the chiefs. So even though they don't convert that many touchdowns, they've still scored, I think the 15th most touchdowns in the red zone in the NFL, but they could be a great offense if they could get that solved. But I, I just thought this was the first game of the year where you had basically a full snap share from both Keenan Allen and Mike Williams and Josh Palmer and all second for what that's worth. And they, they played great offensively. They just couldn't finish. You know, they right. just couldn't finish their drive. So I came away pretty encouraged by it. I know this is kind of a statty show, so I'll tell you that Josh Palmer, almost all of his production was with Mike Williams off the field. Gave me very little confidence to start him next week, even though it's a good matchup against Tennessee. Um, I think it might just be two guys, Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Oh, and obviously Eckler, but I mean in the uh, from the wide receiver unit. All right, that's it for this game. Fantasy Football Today is here to help you dominate your fantasy league all season long, and now you can represent your favorite podcast with official Fantasy Football Today gear only found in the CBS Sports Store. T-shirts, mugs, sweatpants, laser-engraved pint glasses, hats, water bottles, and more. 
to remind your buddies how you got the inside scoop to crush the competition. So if you want to wear something or drink out of a glass or or whatever, uh, what I say, pint glasses, hats, water bottles, all that great stuff with FFT's logo on it, please go to the CBS Sports Store. The link is in the episode description and get 20% off with the code FANTASYFOOTBALL20. 20% off uh, your order. Yeah, 20% off your order when you use the code FANTASYFOOTBALL20 during checkout. All right, go there. I just want to say, you know, you probably hear the pre-recorded ads a lot. I just want to tell you that I honestly just just went on TommyJohn.com slash FFT and bought two things for my wife for Christmas because it's so... It's like the most comfortable clothes. I'm wearing a Tommy John shirt right now. I freaking love it. I wore Tommy John pants last night to sleep. So I highly recommend. Our sponsors are great. They really are. But I don't get to talk to you as much about them from a live read perspective. I just want to tell you, TommyJohn.com slash FFT. I think it's 30% off right now. And um, when you purchase something from Tommy John, it comes with a free surgery. <laughs> That's right. You'll have, you have to wait a year, but you'll be throwing harder than yeah. ever. Uh, TommyJohn.com slash FFT. And we, uh, check out all our sponsors, honestly, because they, they're really, they're great, honestly. honestly. Like, it's, I miss doing the live reads where I can tell you, you know, my personal experiences in more depth, but I, I, our sponsors are terrific. All right, news and notes. Uh, we know I got all the quarterback injuries. Kenny Pickett, Tyler Huntley, Russell Wilson, all with concussions. Oof. There's, there was some optimism about Huntley playing this week, but you get a concussion, you usually miss a week. That's just sort of how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, Brock Purdy has an oblique injury, and I think they'd probably feel good about him playing if it were Sunday. It's more of a toss-up because they have a Thursday game at Seattle. And Mike White's good to go. Damian Pierce don't know the severity of the ankle injury yet. Same with Jeff Wilson. Uh, Khalil Herbert expected to return at some point this season. He's going to miss one more game in Week 15. Then he's eligible to come off in Week 16. I'm sure you David Montgomery managers want him to come off the IR in like week 18. <laughs> um, let's see. Tyler Boyd week to week, maybe a couple weeks for him. No, nothing yet on Higgins or D oh, Debo high ankle sprain. He could miss maybe the rest of the fantasy season. Uh, DJ Moore hurt his ankle. I don't know when he did it. Cause he played almost the entire, right. I think it was very late, but maybe he heard it early and then just aggravated it late. Maybe that was the reason why he had no catches. I don't know, but DJ Moore has an ankle injury. Uh, Tyree Hill ankle, Corey Davis in the concussion protocol, Richie James in the concussion protocol, and Daniel Bellinger has injured ribs. Defensive injuries to keep an eye on. The Jets' superstar defensive tackle, Quinn and Williams, he uh, has a calf injury, I believe. They have a huge game against the Lions coming up. This day. That is a huge game. Yeah. Lions and Jets. Uh, Trayvon Walker left in the fourth quarter for the Jaguars, their rookie. Um, Steven Nelson, the top cornerback for the Texans, who have had a surprisingly good pass defense this year. He's he left with an injury. Uh, Minnesota linebacker Jordan Hicks, a really good player, at least at least a really good IDP player because he gets a lot of tackles. He left with a foot injury. Defensive lineman James Lynch left with a shoulder injury. They had another injury on their offensive line to, a, to an offensive tackle. Um, oh, a Dallas right tackle Terrence Steele is out for the season, unfortunately. So that stinks. Oh, no, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Is he out for the season? I thought it was a season ender. I, I'd need to double and their check. Safety, and they're starting safety, but too. But they will them. be getting Tyron Smith back soon, who's back and practicing, so they'll probably flip over the rookie Tyler Smith to right tackle, I would imagine. All right, we're just seeing now Vita Vea, defensive tackle for the Buccaneers. He has a calf strain. Jamel Dean, starting cornerback. He has a big toe injury. And linebacker Joe Tryon Shoyinka has a hip injury, so they are really quite beat up mm. uh, the Buccaneers and who the heck are they playing this week? They are playing the Bengals. It's not good. All right. Time for some advanced stats from the advanced guy on the show. On. And then we'll do the film break. Oh, wait, 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 no, wait, I forgot about our what? Twitter poll. Oh no. All right. Let's take a look. We this got a really, lot, you know, a lot I gotta stakes. be honest. When I woke up and I saw this poll pop in my mentions today, I was a little bit distraught. I was just the, the rhetoric and the adjective Adam used to describe me, you'll, you'll see it for yourself in a moment for those watching on YouTube, but let's throw the poll up, Adam. Okay, first of all, I posted that at about 12.30 p.m. No, yeah, I shouldn't have said when I woke, woke up. up. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I've been up since. I've been up way earlier. All right, so in our 2QB league, a super flex league, playoff spot is on the line tonight. Which team will win? PPR league, six point per passing touchdown. Adam, I, I Adam Azer, am up by 24 points. I have DeAndre Hopkins. At Dan Schneier NFL has Kyler Murray and Ramondre Stevenson. Who will win? 
Adam or Jerkface Dan Schneider? <laughs> I don't think that was so bad. Yeah, I thought it was gonna be worse. Yeah, I mean, on. jerk. I mean, Adam is like a PG type of guy. He's not gonna get make it that much force. But <laughs> jerk face Dan Schneier. What's so jerky about my face? Well, there's a lot of things actually. I shouldn't have asked that question and went down. No, it's not nothing to do with your actual face. You're just <laughs> a jerk face, you know. It's just a jerk face. I understand, but I think honestly, the karma will come for you with that kind of you know. You will lose this matchup because of what you said. I deserve it because this is oil of Olave. You've been dogging on the team. Oh, I have Olave. dogged on oil of Olave. And you get a chance to eliminate me. If and I you know lose- what, Adam, for the first time in my lifetime, over I don't know what the reason is. I feel like when I see it now, I'm like, this is something. This is God telling me something because now I've been watching like sports games, whatever it is, live TV, and I've been seeing Olave commercials. I did not even know it was the thing that was still. Oil, like, you mean oil of Olay commercials? Olay, I mean, not Olave. Yeah. Olay commercials, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, Olay, I know that brand now. I would have never known it otherwise. Yeah, yeah it's good. Um, I, so I'm somehow winning the vote. Remember, I'm up 24 with Hopkins. He has Kyler and Ramon. I would take your team, too. No, I would take your team. I honestly would have voted for Jerk. I don't think this game's Kyler. going to have a lot of points. I think it's going to be really low scoring. Well, I guess I'll keep my fingers crossed. We need a big James Conner night today. So if I win, I'm in the playoffs. If Dan wins... Thomas Schaefer, our producer, is in the playoffs. <laughs> but am I in no matter what, Thomas? No, you're out, bro. You're out. Oh, um, this is one of those only leagues that I'm out in. Yep. Five and eight or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, at so least I, I set one. my lineup on purpose because Thomas was like, I put extra time into setting my lineup, I should say, because Thomas was like, listen, man, earlier in the week. Thomas, Whoa! Like, yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> We've already said that's okay. He's like, no. no, 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 that's all right. We've already, we established on previous yeah, fantasy. It's okay, but I didn't know that Schaefer was that kind of guy. Wow. He's not that kind of guy. That's a smart, <laughs> he said earlier in the week, make sure you check your lineup because it's, it has major implications wow. and I can get in. And obviously when I hear that <laughs> Thomas can get in and I can knock Azer out, I have a lot more motivation than I would have otherwise. Wow. Okay. All right, Shaver. All right. Good luck. That's not a bad thing. You should be able to do that. My team is so much better than everyone said. It's no, it's not. I mean, I started Russell Wilson and Trevor Lawrence and I might lose this week. All right. Uh, So some stats, Jacob, what do you got for us? Yeah. So the first one I wanted to mention was Jamar Chase. Obviously it came with injuries, but like this was just cool to see him targeted at such a high rate. This was his um, by far the highest Target per route run rate, target share that we've ever seen from him. I uh, drew a target on 40% of his routes, which he had never done. And they really funneled targets to him on first down. I think it all makes sense, like given the injuries that they just like ran everything through him. But we've seen them try to do that a couple times in the past this year, and it hasn't really worked out. Um, and this time it did. He completely dominated. And so like that is just pretty cool because it's been kind of a disjointed season for him. Um, Deshaun Watson played much better this week. His off target rate was down to 5%. Uh, we kind of had fun laughing at some of the, the bad throws and just the horrible um, underlying data as well uh, in his first game. But um, he, I think, yeah, second lowest off target rate in week 14. And that was with an average depth of target that rose compared to last week. So that's encouraging if you are um, a Watson owner or if you're on DPJ or Mari Cooper or Njoku. And on that note, Donald Peoples-Jones, 31% target share, 61% air yardage share. Um, we've seen this from him at times this year as a whole, this year has been much better than last year in terms of ability to draw targets. And there've been times where he's had spike weeks and looked like the wide receiver one ahead of Amari Cooper. And this is one of those weeks. And so since we only have two weeks with Deshaun Watson at quarterback, that's interesting. And then the last note is Najoku ran around on 43 of 47 dropbacks, which is really elite, um, stuff for the tight end position. He was second on the team with nine targets. So if Watson's playing better and he's filling this type of role, that's like a top five tight end rest of the way, maybe top three. Yeah, that's really interesting because, uh, first of all, they're getting their butts kicked lately. They're they're yeah. barely competitive. It's killing Nick Chubb, which we'll talk about. But they're obviously throwing more than what we usually see from Cleveland. Um, I don't know what the case is going to be this week against Baltimore. That feels like a pretty competitive game. Baltimore could be on its third-string quarterback. But I, I just don't really see a game where Cooper, Peoples-Jones, and Njoku are all good. I think mm-hmm. there's only been one game all year where they've all had 50 or more yards. It's almost always two out of three. And that's going to be a little bit frustrating here. Um, and if they start playing more competitive games, if Watson keeps getting better, you know, it might it might be more Nick Chubb and less of all of them. So they are very frustrating. They've got uh, four interesting fantasy options, and maybe five if you include Watson. And um, on a team that's usually that wants to be very run heavy, I don't know that. I I just I'm hesitant to call him the Joku a must start. He probably is, but he's not one of the must starts that's going to be good every week. You know, he's not he's not like Dalton Schultz. 
he's a must start that's going to have bad weeks, I think. Even though Schultz also had had some bad weeks. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's pretty much everyone but Kelsey at this point. Yeah, I guess so. But I mean, you could, you they they're playing each other next week, and you could convince me to start a Joku over Mark Andrews if it's Anthony Brown at quarterback or whatever. You know, uh, who the hell is their quarterback? Um, the Ravens quarterback. Yeah, uh, Anthony Brown. If he's their quarterback next week, so. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else, uh, Jacob? I'm sure you have. Um, I was going to hit on Travis Etienne, but I saw that you have them in the notes. We'll wait on that. But yeah, just the way these drawn targets is really discouraging. Um, and then one encouraging point, um, and this might just be me being an Elijah Moore truther, just holding on to any possible hope. <laughs> but Corey Davis got hurt, and Elijah Moore played ahead of Denzel Mims, which is something we've uh, seen the opposite happen at times this year. But he actually did play quite a bit. He led the team with ten targets and 104 air yards. Elijah Moore is really good, and if he gets a chance to play, I think that he. <laughs> could be relevant in fantasy. So like if you're somebody who's held onto him or you've got best ball shares or whatever, like at least we finally saw an encouraging data point, which we haven't seen in like two months. Okay. Dan. Oh, I'll, I'll give you just a few quick snaps. Yeah. Travis Etienne is 12th in routes run among running backs, but he's 26 in targets. He is 62nd in target per route run rate. And, you know, usually you could still rely on him for two to three catches. He had zero against the Titans. And that was very discouraging. Uh, Joe Mixon, I thought it was great that he was clearly the running back, the running downs back. And it was a pretty limited role for Samaj P. Ryan, but you would like to see more snap share from Mixon. Sometimes first game back, it's not quite, you know, what it's going to be. If he is another game where he's playing, you know, about 60% of the snaps or whatever it was, I think it would be a little bit discouraging for Mixon. Uh, but it wasn't like P. Ryan really cut into his work that much. And this was just weird. You know, Chris Godwin. His two best games have been his lowest slot percentage games. His three worst games have been the games in which he's had his, the highest slot percentage. His two touchdowns this year have come with him on the outside of the formation. Mike Evans lined up right next to him in the slot. So I would guess his production is better out wide than in the slot. I have no idea how to predict what his slot rate is going to be from week to week, but the higher it's been, the worse he has been. Uh, so let's get Chris Godwin on the outside a little bit more. Hey, Dan, what do we got from your game film review? So two of the guys, I had a chance to evaluate three guys on tape. Two of the guys are in our big question. Should I save them or should I go for them? Yeah, save them. Okay, so I'll save them. I'll go for the guy who was not in our four big topics of the week, and that's J.K. Dobbins, who a player who Adam and I had a very different read on. So I know, Adam, you tweeted out you were not very impressed with him. I was incredibly impressed with J.K. Dobbins. So... Let me just start with a little breakdown of what I liked, and I'll get into some specific plays. What I really liked about Dobbins in this game was the vision cuts. Those are back. He does a really good job of setting up the blocks, understanding where the cutback lane is, and then taking it and getting vertical. On his long run, that was probably the least impressive play, I thought, from the standpoint of it didn't show off his burst and his trademark breakaway speed. He houses that. 10 out of 10 times when he's fully healthy. But my expectation is he can get back to full health. So I'm not focusing on that. What I am focusing on on his long run is the vision and his just savvy as a runner. He sees the the hole and he hits it and gets vertical fast. But something I see a lot of running backs do, there's a safety coming down on him, is just take that, just get vertical and keep going straight. What he does is the, right immediately after he gets vertical on that run, he takes a wide angle and gets diagonal. And that gives him the angle on that safety. The safety eventually does come make the play, but it's mul it's, you know, it's all the way down the field after a 45, four yard gain. And the pursuing defender on the backside of the angle he took that diagonal couldn't catch him. So it was really smart angle, but those weren't his, my favorite runs of him. They ran a ton of pistol, which is when the quarterback is right behind the snap and the shotgun, the running backs like a yard behind him instead of lining up to his next to the next to him with a ton of different runs. They had inside zone. They had stretch zone. They had duo up front and they had a mostly power and gap with pullers. And I just thought he did an excellent job of showing contact balance through contact. Yep. We lost Dan Schneier. That's weird. All right. We'll get him back. Well, I guess I'll just, um, come on, Dan, where'd you go? Uh, I guess I'll just get eh, all right. Here we go. He's back. He's back, everybody. All right, all right. Contact balance. Contact balance through contact point. The ability to he oh the way I, what I really like about uh Dobbins besides his ability to make those vision cuts and to have those like jump cuts that get into the right lanes. 
he does a really good job of staying low and his pad level is always so low. There was one run where I have it written in my notes. It was a pistol run at a power gap with two pullers. The end man, the line of scrimmage, those pullers don't get around him. He is setting the edge, that defensive player. And what does Dobbins do instead of running into him or running high where you can make the tackle? This would have been a zero or one yard loss for 75% or more of the running backs I watch on a week to week basis. Dobbins got in between that guy, got super, super low with his pad level and just kind of dove forward for five yards. I thought he did a great job in this game um the best run though for those of you i want to start bringing up like clips in case people do subscribe to the all 22 so they can look at it if you look at uh, q4 with 750 left in the fourth quarter that run there at a pistol zone run off tackle right he does such a good job of letting the entire defensive line flow with the offensive line on this wide zone and then beautiful vision cut back into the middle for i think it was like a 13 yard gain so i thought his vision was great i thought his con the contact balance was great his ability to run with low pad level is great the jump cuts were great he doesn't have the breakaway speed that he used to have right now i'm just banking on he can get that back as he like plays more and as he gets healthier I don't know if that's true. It might be he needs no, he a full said, off season of recovery. But. I sent you the quote. He said, "If I were in better shape, I would have, I would have scored on that play." Right, and he still reached twenty miles per hour on that play, which isn't actually that impressive because I saw a Ravens beat writer say it was like the ninth fastest time of any Raven this year. So he, somewhat he looked, impressive. He, he looked really weird. He did not look fast on that play. Like if, regardless of what the next gen stats say, you could he should have housed that play, and he normally does, but. Everything else that was there with Dobbins that made me fall in love with him as a prospect out of Ohio State is still there and was on film and was on display, I should say, on the tape. Dobbins said he would have scored on his 44-yard gallop if he had been in better shape. Yeah. Uh, this is from Raven. I think it was from BaltimoreRavens.com or the team website. Yeah. It's still not me all the way yet, and I'm going to continue to get better. Hopefully those 100-yard games will turn into 200-yard games. I'm going to keep getting healthier. And if he does, great. I, I don't disagree. The actually the one thing I did notice was yes they well, one of the things I noticed was the vision was great he did a really nice job setting up the blocks and making the cut and, and finding the yards and that was very impressive he just wasn't the explosive J.K. right Dobbins. and that I agree with entirely this wasn't what we were used to from an explosive standpoint all right so before we get into our big topics here uh, there was some music I wanted to play we got a bonus fantasy uh -oh. here on this Monday episode of Beyond the Box Score Fantasy Football today. All right, Fantasy Cops from Trevor. Dear every Star Wars character, help me, you're our only hope. I'm in a 12-team PPR league where six teams make the playoffs. The top two seeds get a bye. Rules are very clear in our league that a league member must always field a full lineup as long as that particular game can affect the league in any way. This point has been reiterated in multiple texts recently, and all league members were aware of the rule prior to this week's games. Our second place team will definitely be taking a loss this week. Our third place team is only one game behind the second place team and has the tiebreaker. Um, his opponent, who's out of the playoffs, failed to start a kicker as his was on a bye. He claims that he wanted to mess with the second place player and wait the entire day to add a kicker. <laughs> we do not buy this reason and believe he was simply negligent. Well, as you may have guessed, the third place team proceeded to pick up both kickers for Monday night before his opponent could, basically locking up the second place position and earning the buy. Obviously, some discussions will take place on our end, so this won't happen in the future, uh, but that doesn't solve our dilemma for this year. Discussion has already taken place that an option would be to have the commissioner remove one of the two kickers and automatically insert him into the negligent manager's lineup. Nothing has been finalized as we hate to punish a team for simply playing the game. I'll be listening. Hope you can offer some sort of remedy or punishment. All right, so we got a buy on the line here. Mm -hmm. Second place team lost. Third place team is going to win tonight unless his opponent's kicker scores like nine points. So he picked up both kickers for Monday Night Football because the opponent's been very lazy, I guess. <laughs> and uh, what do we do here, guys? Do we let it stand or do we remove a kicker from the lineup and give it to the, the opponent? I guess my first question would be like, was there a president set? Because I would imagine right. this isn't the first time that's because the rule in place is essentially you have to feel the full lineup, which I love. I love that rule. But is it self policed? Is a commissioner policed? Because if a president has been set like in the past where someone forgot to do it and a commissioner moves someone in that lineup, then God bless. Put that kicker in that man's lineup right now or that woman or man's lineup right now um, and let it go. But if that hasn't happened before and you have actually relied on people to self-police and they've done a good job of it, and this is your first time ever of this happening, 
now you don't have the president. So now you're like, you're setting the precedent, right? So if you do put that kicker in, you open yourself up to a lot of subjectivity in the future because some people will be like, well, how did you decide which one to put in the lineup, right? And yeah. uh, and and should you penalize this person for being smart? And he didn't really do anything wrong. He just picked up two kickers because the other guy was lazy. So I, I, don't, I think what you decide here is going to kind of decide the future of your league in these situations. And I'm not sure where I stand yet. I want to hear what you two have to say. And then I'll kind of finalize my opinion. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I was thinking the same thing because it says rules are very clear in our league that a league member was always field a full lineup and like they text it about and everything. So I would have thought that there was already a rule in place. Right. And you would just, you know, go by that. I think what they've laid out is about the best that I could come up with off the top in terms of just like you don't want to penalize him or take anything away. But like if you do give give the other person the character that he was going to pick up, that he said he was going to pick up, and like we have a clear rule in place, so you have to do it. I think that makes sense. But yeah, it does set precedence if it hasn't already been set. I think you give him a kicker. I think yeah. the, the rule is, and, and the league, like the spirit of the league is to always right. have a complete lineup. Yeah. If someone went and did something to prevent this manager from having a complete lineup, I think you give him the kicker. I think, I think you, you know, you might let the, um, you might let the third place manager choose the opponent's kicker. If you want to kind of penalize the opponent, but I, think should, yeah. I think you should have a full lineup, and I think you give him the kicker. I think I agree with that. I just think I can't think of it at the top of my, on the top of my head right now, but there could be some situations down the line where this is brought back up, and people are like, "No, no, no, you can't do this because remember the time you made me pick somebody and you put him in somebody's lineup, and it's just like it opens up a Pandora's box." I guess so, but hey, don't be so freaking lazy. Pick up a stupid. <laughs> yeah, really. You. you created a lot of problems for this league. The fantasy cops will not have any of this crap anymore. <laughs> Get it together. All right, four big topics when we come back on fantasy football today. Welcome back to the show, everybody. All right, we're talking about some struggling running backs. Heath's first. This is not Heath Cummings. A different guy named Heath. Believe it or not. Uh, four big topic, and I just said, believe it or not, and that's a Heath thing. <laughs> that is a Heath thing. Um, do you bench the big name running backs in the playoffs that are slumping, Chubb, ETN, etc., for emerging fresh legs like Bam Knight? So, Jacob, I'll give, I'll give you the first word here. Nick Chubb. I think we should really take this week by week. Mm -hmm. Nick Chubb has arguably the best run defense in football right now. Since trading for Roquan Smith, the Ravens are allowing 2.6 yards per carry to running backs in five games. That's insane. Uh, but he is Nick Chubb. Travis Etienne is obviously struggling. He gets Dallas this week. They're not great against the run, but they don't give up a lot of points to the running backs. To bench them for a guy like Bam Knight, who's facing the Lions, who's actually been also very good against the run lately, or, I don't know, Pacheco. Um, those are the names that come to mind. Uh, Deontay Foreman, maybe. I don't know. What do you think? I think you could consider benching Etienne for Pacheco. I don't know about Bam Knight, just given the, the way the usage broke down. We did see Michael Carter play more this week and really dominate the um, passing downs for the jets i'm pretty concerned about etn like you mentioned he ran 25 routes this week didn't draw a single target he's been targeted at such a low rate this year um he's been targeted at a lower rate than nick chubb he's been targeted at a lower rate than freaking brian robinson like it's been insane um and his schedule isn't great in terms of run defense coming up here um until the fantasy championship against houston so the next two spots for etn i think he's probably going to project as like a, a outside of the top 20 at running back, which is pretty nuts given where we were just a couple of weeks ago. Um, for Nick Chubb, the matchup against the Ravens is tough. And same thing with the commanders in two weeks. And even the Saints is not an ideal matchup, but each of these are games that the Browns could control the game script a little bit better than we've seen. Because um, like the offenses they're playing are really not inspiring right now. Like even less inspiring than the Browns at defense. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think I think you're probably rolling with Chubb um, over most of these guys going forward, but I think you could bench ETN. Dan, I know you did some, I think you did some film study on Nick Chubb or the Browns. Um, I'll just say in, in their five wins, he's averaging 22.2 .2 carries per game and 110 rushing yards per game. In their eight losses, 15 carries per game, 75.3 rushing, uh, uh, rushing yards per game. But it goes further than that. It's not just wins and losses. It's blowout losses. As long as they're competitive, you're getting a decent workload from Nick Chubb. It's it, the problem is they just haven't really been that competitive lately. Um, you know, like they lost by 13 to Cincinnati, I believe. He had 14 carries. They lost by uh, eight to the Bills, but that was an 18 point game in the fourth quarter. He had 14 carries. They got crushed by the Dolphins. He had 11 carries. What do you think about Chubb? Yeah, so I did every snap of Chubb versus Cincy, and I also did every snap of Lawrence 
this week. So I'm just going to start with a quick takeaway from ET- ETN. I think it's really interesting to note watching their watching that film, watching the Jaguars offense. There is nothing for the running backs in the pass game. There's no involvement in the screen game. They throw their screens to tight ends. There's no involvement really in the play action quick hitting game. They throw those quick hitters to Evan Ingram or to those like tight ends leaking. So there's no real there's no wheel routes. There's really nothing to get these running backs involved in the pass game. So I think that is something to really consider right now, especially as we watch that Jags pass game, which we'll talk about in a little bit, evolve into such a heavy hitter. Like right now, that pass game is operating at a high level so that they don't need the run game as much. So I agree with Jacob what he said on ETN. Now, as far as Chubb goes, watching the film against Cincy, I just felt like since he was fully prepared right now, teams are playing the Browns, like they don't have a good quarterback in place. I know it's Deshaun Watson. He has a big name, but right now it almost looks like they're playing him like it's some backup quarterback because their classic play, the stretch zone, which the Browns have run for years with Nick Chubb, every single time they tried stretch zone against Cincinnati, those Cincinnati defenders were stacked around the line of scrimmage. They didn't lose con- contain and they flowed everything back to the inside. They tried a lot of misdirection in this game, which really surprised me and takes away touches from Nick Chubb. They gave the ball to Hunt on a misdirection with Chubb in the backfield. They kept the ball with Watson one time on a misdirection with Chubb in the backfield. They handed it on an end around one time to Njoku with Chubb in the backfield. Chubb was on the field for every one of those plays, but he was used as eye candy to kind of get the defense to focus in on him and flow to his direction while they hand it off to someone else. Ultimately, that's not good for his value in general for fantasy because he's not getting the football there. So this was a tough matchup. DJ Reader was back and he played unbelievable. Like when you watch a film of running back, you can watch the D line and O line. And he was like one of the best players on the field, maybe in general in that game. And so that's a big factor, but you just mentioned it. The matchups aren't getting that much easier. Really? Maybe the game script's getting a little better. Maybe, but I don't know if that's even the case right now, watching the Bengals offense because Watson, I know you said the stats were a little better, Jacob, but I was not too impressed with watching Watson this game. So right now I just feel like it's a bad situation. Defenses are going to be keying in on the run game taking away the stretch zone, which they love to run. And so I don't know if they're going to keep using him also like eye candy on some of those plays and giving the ball to Njoku or, or Hunt or keeping it with Watson. I don't really know what he is, a 14-touch player, right? Doesn't get much involvement in yeah. the pass game. I think he'll be more than that as long as they're competitive. Again, it's like they If don't... they're competitive, right. And I think they will be against the Ravens and the Saints and the Commanders personally. But they have but... to run the ball to be competitive at this yeah. point, it feels like. No, no, right. This is unusual for for him in his last five games, he's averaging like three, 3.8 yards per carry. But that is, that is like a, a normal running back averaging two yards per carry. Yeah. I mean, for Nick Chubb, that's, that's surprising. What's different though. It's not like he's ever had a good quarterback, you know? So I, I have faith in him to run the ball. Well, I, I think he can, but it's like, Derrick yeah. Henry, right. I mean, Derrick Henry, all the metrics were terrible for Derrick Henry going into this game against Jacksonville. He ran for like 95, or yeah, against Jacksonville. He ran for 95 yards in the first quarter. Right. So I don't think it's going to take much. I just think they have to be in the game so he can get his 17 to 22 carries. And it'll probably be all right. Yeah, but that's that, fair. I think I'm mostly more, this was just a bad matchup. I'm more, con- I, mean, I am concerned about him this week because the Ravens are ridiculous on defense. Yeah. Right? Uh, the Saints and the Commanders, I feel like he can do fine against. Any last thoughts, Jacob? Oh, I'm I'm with you. I think the abilities there. We've really never seen Chubb been bottled up before, and he's been in lots of bad offenses. I think he'll get going, and I think the game scripts are going to be a lot better. I'll I'll be interested to see both those games because I think Commanders are playing much better in run defense. I just watched oh, them two weeks ago. Oh, it's yeah. the Giants. They're really yeah, they it's are. a similar thing to Cincy. They're super sound in their gap technique. Like I, we'll see what happens there. Yeah. Now, if you want to talk about Barkley as another struggling running back, <laughs> I'm losing a lot of faith in. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's averaging 6.2 yards per catch. That's terrible. That his is- yards per carry has also dipped every oh, single yeah. week from his average the first eight games before the bye. Every single week it's been below his average Wow, since the bye. And I, I mentioned this stat, and this is a guy I'm not considering sitting, but Dalvin Cook averaged 1.5 yep. yards per carry against the Lions yesterday. His fewest in any game in which he's had 10 or more carries in his career. He does not look good in that. In my opinion, he does not look good in that blocking scheme. Well, the Lions the also start. have really come on, though, as a, as a run defense. Yeah, they're playing better. Bam night. All right, uh, Jacob, this one's handpicked for you. Tommy wants to know, can we trust Jerry Judy in the playoffs? He has Arizona, the Rams, and the Chiefs in the playoffs. Can we trust Jerry Judy three touchdowns yesterday? 
I think so. I don't um, necessarily love the spot against the Rams just because I think the Broncos, the Rams are so bad right now, but they played a little bit better this week. Um, but I just, in general, my projections against the Rams go way down for the uh, passing offenses in terms of volume. Um, he's kind of a volume yeah. player right now, but um, he's completely dominating the target share. I think Jerry Judy's really good. I've, you know, obviously we've been talking about that for a long time, but when he's been on the field, um, so any play that Jerry Judy has been on the field on those plays, he has a 26% target share and a 36% air yarded share. Um, both of those would be like top 12 rates um, over the course of the full season. I think that it's fair that like he might really be that type of a player. Um, and then when he projected with, you know, the overall offensive environment that drops him down to like top 20 ish wide receiver, which is someone you can trust most weeks, especially in not negative matchups, which is what he has coming up. So I, I feel pretty good about him. I think I had him ranked 20th this week. And if I would have known that he's going to play the full lob into the slots, he projected as like a top 14 guy um, against the chiefs in a game where they're going to be passing a lot. And so that's yeah. what you're looking at in the fantasy championship. And he played, only I think 18% of his snaps in the slot this week. Mm -hmm. They moved him to the 15.5%. Uh, his previous low in a game, uh, you know, week 13, you know, two games ago, he played 47%, but he barely played in that game. His previous low was 56%. So he's a slot receiver, but he, with Colin Sutton out, he was an outside receiver almost exclusively. He's been much better when he's outside of the slot, though, in college and in the pros. Um, he's just kind of been pigeonholed into that spot because he's been playing alongside Tim Patrick and Corlin Sutton, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think he has proven that he can definitely win from the outside. Well, that's the big question here is I, I trust Jerry Judy if there's no Cortland Sutton. And even if somebody like Russell Wilson is playing, do I trust Jerry Judy if Brett Rippon is playing, which is probably the case against the Cardinals? And do I trust Jerry Judy if Cortland Sutton's on the field? Because we just haven't seen big production from him all that much, just in a little bit, uh, with Sutton playing. And I, I, I think, again, you, you take it week to week. But last yesterday was the absolute best scenario for Judy, right? No Sutton. Russell Wilson finally played well, and they played they played the Chiefs, and they were trailing twenty seven nothing. It doesn't get any better than that. Uh, so the injuries, I think, to 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 his quarterback and his wide receiver are, I think, they're a big deal. Jacob, do you or I, I mean, do you think they factor in? I don't think Sutton actually affects him all that much. They've run uh, 250 routes together this season, which is a decent sample size. And Judy has a 25% target share and a 34% error to share. So pretty close to the numbers I just gave. Um, just when he's been on the field in general, he really hasn't been affected that much in terms of his ability to draw volume when Sun's out there. So, but if, if you're going to say like Sun being out there will move him to the slot more and he's less efficient there, then I, that's fair. Yeah. But I think he's still clearly proven to be the number one receiver when Sun's there. All right, this is from Jay. Pass catcher distribution for Trevor Lawrence. We have kind of discussed this, uh, mm. but there's actually a lot here. <laughs> yeah. Um, because Zay Jones has double-digit targets in three of his last four games. We know Travis Etienne is not a big part of it. I said earlier, Trevor Lawrence has thrown the most passes in the NFL into the end zone, most end zone attempts. Christian Kirk has 10 end zone targets. Zay Jones has 10. That's a lot. Evan Ingram has six. Um, I think, you know, we could talk about the past distribution guys, but Dan, I think we should talk about the schedule because he's faced, um, well, he, you know, he had a great game against Baltimore, that Baltimore, was, yep. but the chiefs before that, it was a nice matchup. He was bad. He struggled against the lions two weeks ago, but they've obviously been a lot better. Yeah. Uh, the Titans were playing without their top cornerback and they see more passes than almost anyone in football. It's about to get a lot more challenging Dallas and the jets in the next two weeks. So, you know, what do you think this means for the passing offense and I guess for the target distribution? Yeah, those matchups aren't great, but I will say this, having watched the tape of Trevor Lawrence this week against Tennessee, that was phenomenal quarterback play. That was elite level quarterback play. And I don't say that, I don't throw that word around a lot. I really only feel like very few quarterbacks are making a difference on a week to week basis. Burrow, Herbert, Mahomes, Allen, not too many more than that. Trevor Lawrence played at that level in this game. What was interesting most to me is that there wasn't a really, it didn't feel like there was any kind of focus to get the ball to Christian Kirk, a player who earlier in the season, there was a massive focus. He even had a good game recently as well. 
But Zay Jones is the player who keeps popping up for me. They came within inches. I don't know what really what happened because from the all 22 angle, Lawrence threw about a 45 yard bomb that hit him right in the hands, split the safety in the cornerback. One of the best throws I've seen all year. And it just dropped it. Um, and so there still is a massive involvement for Jones. He's probably the one I would feel most confident in outside of Christian Kirk, but they're not going to like, target one player or funnel targets through a certain type of player. They're just going to spread the ball around. He's at that. T- he's at that point right now, Lawrence, where he's as comfortable as he is in the pocket. His pocket manipulation is amazing. His arm talent is filthy and he trusts his, He fit incredible amount of hole shots in this game. One tight window he, ball he threw to Evan Ingram, where Ingram just ran up the seam. And there was literally five yards of space between the linebacker and the safety. I counted it on my screen. And Ingram was stacked right between them. So that was another yard. So basically four yards. And he threw the ball between them, hits the tight end right in the stomach. It's caught. And so he's just going to take what's there for him. So I don't really trust from a fantasy standpoint any of these guys. And I am a little bit worried, like you said, about the schedule because those whole shots won't be there if if he's facing other defenses, I think. We'll see yeah. what happens, especially the Jets. Dallas is Dallas is a little depleted, though, in the last two Dallas weeks. Dallas is a little depleted. Starting that corner, one I feel a little, yeah. Safety. Sorry. Um, it's a, I think it's going to be a matter of, can they protect Trevor Lawrence? I, but know, I'll say this though, on that note, Adam, there were multiple times in this game and I have in my notes right now, I'm looking at him with timestamps where the pressure, where the protection broke down for Lawrence. And he did a phenomenal job of moving around in the pocket, sometimes out of the pocket to rip a ball, sometimes to his left to find Agnew on that third and four. So I don't think the pressure played a huge role. In, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think he got pressured in this game yeah. and did a great job throwing under pressure. That's like like Justin Herbert last night. Right. Under pressure the entire game. He was able to get away from it. Um, yeah, you know, I'll bring this up here. I, I was, uh, <laughs> it was, I was not, I guess didn't have a popular opinion last night on the recap show. I said, I'd rather have Trevor Lawrence than Justin Fields in dynasty. I would right. definitely rather have Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields in dynasty. Hmm. What do you think Jacob? That's really tough. I think Lawrence probably has a better shot of sticking around and being a quarterback for a long time. You know, so especially if you're like in a super flex league, um, the added stability there of like potentially having 10 good years from Lawrence is really valuable. Um, But man, the upside for Justin Fields, if he's able to sustain anything close to what we've seen this year over multiple years, like he's a difference maker. He's one of the most valuable in super flex. He's like one of the most valuable players available at any position. Hmm. Um, And just in a normal dynasty league, he's got top three, top five quarterback upside which i don't know if lawrence necessarily does for fantasy um i think he does eventually we'll see what happens but i yeah. mean i what he's what there's a thing I that forgot. people always love to talk about like oh the weapons everybody what weapons does trevor lawrence have right now christian kirk is like his best weapon he's a solid player i don't think he's a wide receiver one zay jones he's getting career games out of zay jones and evan yeah. ingram like evan ingram i watched for five years on the giants be horrific at football <laughs> and he just had a career game with that and like he's and it's not like their old line's very good either cam robinson's an okay left tackle and they don't have and they have sheriff and not much else so i really like what i've seen from lawrence i know what you're saying with fields because the rushing upside like mm-hmm. it's probably a bad take by us adam to want lawrence over fields in dynasty i get that there's well, everybody's obsessed much. with the runner but the better, say? everybody's obsessed with the runner but right. first and for foremost, good reason you got to pass the ball you can't just be a runner fantasy, you gotta be a though passer. yeah yeah no, I, find, it, me a, find me a top five quarterback that's not that's not putting up good passing numbers it just doesn't happen i mean would it be uh, fields i guess no, he's not he a top not, five quarterback. Not on a per game basis, is he not? No, still because no. he had that bad start to the season. Oh, yeah, terrible! Yeah. I mean, he's not even close because of that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's um, just, yeah, it's a good point. Know, I mean, maybe Fields becomes Justin Hur- uh, Jalen Hurts. Maybe he becomes Jalen Hurts and has a huge leap because Jalen Hurts. I never thought he could become this good of a passer. But he would need like a two, he would need the team to get a lot better, right? Like Jalen Hurts has the best <laughs> offensive line in football. He has AJ Brown and Devontae Smith. The Bears are like nowhere close to fielding yeah. fields that kind of team. Um. I'm gonna say all right. I don't think I don't think Jacob gave his answer, Jake. All right, so listen, you've got <laughs> Justin Fields, I've got Trevor Lawrence. I just sent you a trade offer in Dynasty. My Lawrence for your fields, accept or reject. Uh, I'm gonna keep fields. I I mean I laid out a few different scenarios in which I think you could go either way, depending on the format of the league, um, what your philosophy is, what you're doing with your team, if you need to swing for more upside with fields. Um, but just in a vacuum, I'll take fields. All right, all right. Screw you, man. Uh, <laughs> all the beast. Last topic here. Can you trust the New Orleans Saints? Great schedule coming up. Indeed, they do. Atlanta. Well, actually, I don't know about Cleveland. I don't think Cleveland has that bad of a defense. They have a bad run defense for sure. Mm-hmm. They're pretty good against the pass. Atlanta at Cleveland and then at Philadelphia, which is obviously not 
an easy game. Can you trust the Saints? In the Saints' last five games, since they destroy the Raiders, um, they've been terrible. They're one and four. They have scored 16 or fewer points in four of those five games. They have not run more than 56 plays in any of them. They've had the ball for 25 minutes and 10 seconds or less in three of them. They've just been awful. But they face the Ravens, Steelers, Rams, Niners, and Bucks. So it is going to get, I guess, a little bit easier. So, Dan, do you trust the New Orleans Saints going forward? I do not trust the New Orleans Saints going forward. I understand the schedule is somewhat favorable, as we just broke down. But I've watched that offense all year. I my, I'm sticking with my guns on this. I don't. I think that losing Sean Payton was the biggest difference that I've seen in that offense. They're just. I know they have some of the same people who worked with him and they understand his system and they're not running a different system. But those game, you know, those play to play situational play calls that Sean Payton had and the timing, when to call the screen, you know, finding the defense off guard when you call the screen, things of that nature. It's not there anymore for this offense. So I think they've lost their magic from a scheme and schematic standpoint and. You take away the magic from a schematic standpoint. You take away Taron Armstead at left tackle. You don't have much left. You have Alvin Kamara. And what else? Like, where is the talent on that Saints team that makes me believe that offense can spark and get going right now? Alave as well. I shouldn't I shouldn't have uh, <laughs> not included him. There's two really talented players, but not much talent at quarterback, not much talent on the offensive line, not much talent from a – or not much success from a schematic standpoint. I don't like it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, effectively, the question is, can you trust Chris Olave or Alvin Kamara, right? Like, is there anyone else from the Saints offense that we're caring about for fantasy? Um, no. Well, Juwan Johnson is an interesting tight end, but I don't trust him no. as far as I can throw him, and I can't throw him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if it's just those two, I think yes. I mean, Olave, since he's become the starter, has double-digit points in every game except for one, PPR points, um, and the volume has just consistently been there, and these are pretty good matchups coming up. Um, and Kamara with... Ingram out, I think we should see his usage be better um, than it was. Ingram was getting annoyingly involved, um, and we've got some really good matchups for him. Like the Cleveland matchup is great for him. It's not as great for Alave necessarily, but I think I trust those two to be people you can plug in, and they do give you upside because they're such talented players as well. Like they do give you the big play upside. Um, overall offensive environment, no, we, we don't feel good about it, obviously. Yeah, I think um, Eric McCoy, if they can get him back, they're starting center. He's missed that would the last be huge. five games, I believe, and that's when all their struggles started, maybe the last four. And that would be big coming out of the bye if they can get him back. Um, yeah, I don't know. Unfortunately, they're sticking with Andy Dalton. But this is probably a good week for them. I, I'm going to be starting Alvin Kamara. Put it this way. I, I would start Kamara over Barkley. I would start Kamara mm. over ETN. And in yeah. a full PPR league, I'd probably start him over Nick Chubb this week. Hmm. Yeah. How do you guys feel about that? I think I agree with all. Rick Face Dan, what do you think? Um, say that again. Sorry. <laughs> Starting Camara over Barkley, Chubb, and ETN. In PPR. Camara over Barkley, Chubb, and ETN. I start him over Barkley in that matchup. I start him over. Yeah, I think I might start him over all three of those. Yeah. Just sad to say. Boy, you know, uh, our show must have been so boring today because our chat on YouTube. They were talking about movies almost the entire time. <laughs> the entire time. Just talking about. I don't think it was boring. I think it was a good show. So <laughs> screw, was very I, I don't want to say screw the chat. I love the chat. But <laughs> sometimes it's more fun to talk about movies. I understand. What about that. Christopher Nolan? Kevin Smith, the best <laughs> actor in any which way you can, was Clyde. <laughs> Terry Gilliam is good. I love Guy Ritchie. Like, what are you guys talking about? Clint Eastwood. <laughs> there was some Tarantino talk earlier. There was a lot of Titanic talk. In the chat today, a lot of Titanic talk. John Favreau isn't bad. Like, this is really fun. I think Dan is the one who tweeted that or retweeted maybe what? that Elf is not funny. Is that you? That what is not funny? Elf? No, I didn't. Definitely did not say that. Okay. that is Do not, not accuse take. me of that. <laughs> that's <laughs> not my that take. Someone from our someone from our company did though, and that's what I kind of like. I think I quote tweeted saying this was a bad take. Oh, you quote tweeted like it was a bad take. Who wrote? Was that Chris? I don't think it was Chris though. It was probably Thomas, right? We I would his, think it would be Chris. Thomas week. has some weird. I agree with Thomas on some, some of his takes. Are I love Elf. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> Thomas got mad at me for being an ageist yesterday. What did he say? Um, I bought a sweater. I bought a Christmas sweater that says, "I don't know, Margo," and I thought Dave would get the reference, mm. and Heath wouldn't. And I was right about Heath, but Dave did not get it. And Schaefer was the only one who got the. Well, I don't know Margot reference. What is it in reference to? Christmas Vacation. 
Uh, I never seen it. Whoa. Whoa. Why does this still surprise you when I say never seen it? I've seen like four total movies. They're all like <laughs> Pulp Fiction, The Godfathers, Goodfellas, Casino. Oh, man. All right. Well, uh, Christmas Vacation, one of the best Christmas gangster movies. You should definitely watch it. Gangster movie. Okay. I love it. All right. Thanks for watching and listening, everybody. We will talk to you tomorrow with the waiver wire for Fantasy Week 15. Rex Burkhead. All right. See you then.